our Lima Community Church family. We're so glad to welcome you here to our online worship experience today. Thanks for being here with us. This Veterans Day weekend, we want to take just a minute to say thank you to all of you out there who have served in uh, one of the branches of the armed services. We're so grateful for your service and your sacrifice for our country and the freedoms that we are afforded thanks to that. So thank you on this Veterans Day weekend to all of you who have served in that important capacity. I want to uh, remind you that Thanksgiving is now just 11 days away. And uh, if you are planning to join us for the Thanksgiving dinner at the Civic Center, we're excited about that event. We do still need help in three particular areas. We need help directing traffic that day. We need help with the cleanup crew. And it, even if you're not able to be there the day of, if ahead of time, you might be able to help with some pecan pies uh, that's what we need help with for Thanksgiving. So we hope that you'll be able to help us with that. We're excited about that time to serve our community together uh, during this holiday season. We want to thank you again for being here with us today. We're continuing in our series, The Next Chapter, just talking about the book of Acts and what it has to teach us about how we continue to function as the church of Jesus Christ. We hope and pray and trust that God will be meeting with you wherever you are today, just as he is meeting here with us. Thanks for being here. God bless you. The Harvest, a time to look back with thankfulness and to look forward with hope. In the Bible, the harvest is a time to consider all that God has done, providing, sustaining, helping, and blessing, to remember that all we have is from God's hand, and so we thank Him for it. But in the Bible, the harvest isn't just a time to look back in thankfulness, but also to look forward in hope, to remember that life isn't ultimately about food and crops and plants and prophets. Life is about God, about knowing Him, loving Him, and serving Him. Jesus once said, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. He wasn't talking about crops. He was talking about people, people who don't yet know, love, and serve God, people who need to hear the good news of the gospel. So Christian, this harvest season, let's not forget to thank God for his everyday kindness and provision, but let's also not forget to pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to raise up workers and send them out into his field, because God is the Lord of the harvest. testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony hey good morning would you put your hands together today lift our voice Come together, sons and daughters, fought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Oh yes, our God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony from death life. Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony No matter where you are in life Don't forget God's not done with you 
Actually, he might just be beginning with you. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Yes, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Maybe you just need to sing this over yourself. Greater things are still to come. Yes, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn grace into garden. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Hey, would you clap your hands today? This is my testimony from death to life. It's grace for you of my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Amen, somebody. And welcome to Lima Community Church today. As we continue in worship, I want to invite you to have a seat. It's good to see you. Good to be with you. Good morning, friends. It's good to sing our testimony together, isn't it? It's great to be with you all today. Thanks so much for being here with us at Lima Community Church. Ushers, if you would come forward at this time. And as the ushers are coming forward, we want to take a minute and say thanks to some folks. Uh, it's Veterans Day weekend. And we'd like to just ask anybody in the room who is a veteran or an active uh, duty military uh, person, if you would stand and allow us to express our thanks to you, that'd be great. Thank you all so much for your service. Would you pray with me? God, we're grateful today for these who have stood and who have, uh, who have given of their lives for our freedom, freedom that allows us to be here to worship you today. We thank you for them today. We pray that they would feel our uh, love and appreciation. And even more than that, God, your love for them. God, we thank you for meeting with us here. We thank you for the gift of, uh, of giving to you. And as we give your tithe and our offering now, we pray that you would uh, honor these gifts and that you would use them abundantly beyond what we could even dream about to build your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, go ahead, please. Thank you. And as the ushers begin to serve, let me tell you about several announcements for the life of the church and the community. We've got a membership class coming uh, next Sunday morning. Uh, it'll be at nine o'clock over in the Journey Building. And if that's something that you are interested in, if you'd maybe like to consider becoming a member of Lima Community Church or even just finding out more about the Church of the Nazarene and some of the things that we believe, we would love to have you uh, in the membership class so you can join us there next Sunday. If you are planning to do that, we need you to RSVP by Tuesday of this week. So just here in the next couple days, let us know. Uh, there's information in your bulletin about how you can do that. Uh, if you purchased a chicken or rib dinner to support Royal Family Kids Camp, uh, today's the day. So if you weren't sure about lunch and you purchased those, now you're sure about lunch. 
because now you know what's happening. So just remember to pick those up by 1 o'clock today uh, over in the Axis, and that is just a, um, a carryout only. We're not going to be serving over in the Axis today, but those will be ready until 1 o'clock. And then finally, uh, we are just 11 days from the Thanksgiving dinner, and we need your help specifically in a few areas uh, that haven't been totally filled yet. So on Thanksgiving Day at the Civic Center, we need some people to help direct traffic. Now, this would be for the folks who are driving through to get their dinners to go. So we need some traffic directors. I think at all of the, um, in all of the shifts, like all the three different kind of shifts, we'll need traffic directors. We also need some folks to help with the cleanup crew. And then those are the two that are on the day of. If you know you're not able to help on the day of, but maybe between now and then you've got some time, we need some more pecan pies. We just don't have enough pecan pies. And so if you could help us with that, that would be great. Uh, for all three of those needs, if you'll just visit the church website, click on the button or the banner that says Thanksgiving dinner, and then that'll walk you through how you can sign up to bring those things. That would be a huge, huge help to us. I also want to let you know that that great big TV out in the foyer uh, has is, is rotating some pictures of the Thanksgiving dinner uh, from the last few years. And so that might be something fun for you to take a look at. It really is a great opportunity to serve our community. And uh, we thank you for your help with that. It's good to be here today. It's good to be with you. Winter arrived yesterday, didn't it? I was, uh, I was out in the backyard taking care of leaves, and then the snow came, and it was a race. And the snow won, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, it's so good to be here with the people of God in, in God's house. We're glad to worship with you. Would you stand? And would you take a minute and just find somebody around you? Give them a hug or a handshake. Tell them how glad you are to worship with them today. We're glad you're here.
this time, which is the time of harvest. It's a time of changing, right? And really the, the constant in our lives that we recognize as this community of faith is the faithfulness of God. I think it was last week I had mentioned this phrase by David where he says, I, I encourage myself, I speak to myself. And sometimes as people of faith, when we are in the mundaneness of our lives, a life of faith requires us to, to remind ourselves of what we've seen in the past as we anticipate what God's going to do in the future. And in just thinking about, in thinking about worship this week, uh, believe it or not, there's actually nothing extra spectacular about November 13th, 2022. Um, yet Christ is among his people today. Christ is with us today. Christ uh, actually wants to speak to us today, to minister to us. And just re reflecting on that magnificent reality, just thinking about my own hunger and longing and thirst. And then we're going to sing a song that's really a, just a prayer chorus of hungering for God, thirsting for God. And as we do, or we're going to move to a time of prayer. And I just want to encourage you Maybe you find yourself in a place of hungering and thirsting for God. Maybe in a place of particular emptiness. God's calling out to us. He's calling out to you. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He offers us great rest today. Just in recognition of his presence, I want to invite you to open your hands. It's this twofold gesture of offering ourselves to God, but also receiving from him. I invite you to call out to him in your own way today. Lord Jesus, we need you. We're desperate for you.
Would you join me in prayer this morning? Oh, Father, how, how beautifully you've brought us into your presence through music, Lord, and words of truth. And Lord, this song that we've just sung, it is the prayer of our heart. And we've tried... We've tried to find meaning and fulfillment, peace, joy. Man, we've tried in relationships. We've tried in status and work and experiences. Lord, in my own life, I know that it, I was still wanting, never satisfied, Lord. It was only until I found my identity as your child. Lord, I long to just live there, to know that, to experience that, to grow in relationship with you. And today, Lord, this is the prayer of our heart. You're all that we're living for because we realize that in you, We found what we so desperately long, what we need, what we hope for. Lord, I pray that all of us in the building today, right now, would, would allow this song, this prayer, this moment to set the tone for this week. To know that in the rat race of life and the obligation and the duty and the going forward and the figuring it out, Lord, that truly the only place to be centered in the middle of that is your child being your child, connected to you, receiving your love, living into your love and experiencing your grace. Lord, help us today to not lose sight of this, to allow this to be the deep centered cry of our heart. Thank you. Thank you that you love us so much that you long for us to experience this kind of heart. Thank you, Lord. I just feel today right now, Lord, that in this room, people are longing, searching, feeling hopeless about things or their own life, and I pray that these words would sink deep into their soul. You're what we long for. You're what satisfies. And you are standing with arms outstretched, longing and waiting for us to just trust you. We do this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Just sing that chorus together again. I'm falling on my knees, offering all of me, Jesus, your all this heart is living for. Amen. trees. Hopelessness is starting to wreak havoc. Son of man, I know you see the deepest depth unknown to me. You have planted seeds among the ashes. You rebuild, you restore all that's broken. From the ruins, you redeem, you return all that's stolen. From your children, that's what you do. Soapy 
still my anxious heart All that's gone is never lost Emmanuel is here and he is faithful So I won't let my praises stop I'll sing it from these rubble rocks Cause I know you are good and you are gospel writer provides an amazing account of the early church in his 28 chapters of Acts. Page after page, chapter after chapter, we find stories of the Spirit's inspiration and direction. Acts provides us with perspective regarding the early church's mission of inclusion, generosity, and community ethics. We read this ancient book, praying that these accounts will guide us as we endeavor with God's help to write the next chapter of our own story. Well, good morning. morning. It's great to see you today. You know, isn't it a freeing thing when you come to the realization sometime in your life that you just can't be good at everything? (laughs) Have you got there? Some of you are still holding out. I can tell you think it's so freeing to realize, you know what? I'm not good at everything and I don't have to be. And so um, realizing, you know, jumping into this series last week and, and uh, wanting to continue with who we are as a church and living into what's next, looking forward, being proactive, expectant on what God can do through us as a people and this, this next theme that's a part of who we are, right? And, and every year around this time, we, we live into this, we, we, we challenge ourselves, we listen to the Lord speaking to us. And I realize that I can talk about it, I can lay it out there, I'm just not very good at details. I'm just not. And um, man, this crew's a lot more reserved than the first service. 
You got a joke, Brad, or can you warm them up a little bit? But, um, but guess what? We have somebody that is great at details. And so I'm going to let Brad talk about how you can be involved with Next, because he does a far better job than I would. So Brad, tell us about, yeah. if we're talking about this, what are next steps? What yeah. can we do? Well, I'm grateful for all the all of y'all who are great at all the things that I'm not good at too. Yeah. So, um, but I'm happy to help with this. So uh, we are really glad to be in this next sermon series, the next capital campaign. So there's a card that Pastor Chip's holding there. It's in the seat pockets in front of you. If you want to grab one of those, take a look at it now. Uh, if you would like to pledge, that's good there, Adam. I see that. If you'd like to pledge, you can fill that card out. And there are boxes, there's two boxes in the back, kind of where the offering boxes used to be, where you can drop those pledge cards off on your way out uh, today or, or next week. Uh, that would be fine as well. Now, if you have moved to the digital uh, version of giving, like many have, uh, there's a way that you can pledge online too. So if you visit this website, limacommunitychurch.com slash next, you can also get there just by going to the church website and clicking the next banner or the next button, uh, there's a place there that'll bring up essentially that same card, but just on the website. So you can fill it out there. Now, here's the great thing about doing it online. If you decide to do it that way, when you're, when you're done with your pledge, it'll take you to a page that will then allow you to set your, set your giving up. So let's say you're going to do $50 a month for next. When you fill out the pledge card online, after you're done with it, there will be a link that you can click where it will take you to the church giving site where you can just set up that $50 to come out automatically every month through whatever payment method you choose. And so it just simplifies and streamlines things a little bit. Um, one, one final note, many of you have been giving to the next campaign uh, maybe when it was even all the way back to when it was called Pressing On. And even before that, it was Chapter 3. Any Chapter 3 folks here? You guys remember? Yeah, there's a few of you. So many of you have been, just been given, and you just have kept giving and kept giving. And we are so grateful for that. But we still would like for you to pledge. It's very helpful for us as we plan, as we budget, as we look out at this coming year at projects that we're looking at. Um, it's just helpful to know what we can expect to, uh, to bring in. So even if you're one of those very faithful givers, if you could fill out that pledge card, that would be very helpful to us. So uh, is that the That's detail awesome. you needed? That's good, right? Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. That's the how right there. Now I'm going to try to continue to talk about the why. And last week as we were jumping into this, I'm thinking about, okay, we're a next forward-thinking church we um, were interested in being proactive. And if I'm going to stand up there and challenge us to, to be oriented this way, why? And I began to realize that the next chapter for us, the story of God being written in this local context, is always going to look like uh, is faithful to what God has always done. And he's just constant. Uh, his methods work. The principles are true regardless of where, when, how, and even um, the age. And so in 21st century Lima, it's actually the book of Acts that continues to show us that as they were used by God to see his kingdom come and really transform their world, the same principles are at play for us in this context. And so as we write the next chapter, and, and, and I like this idea that there's 28 chapters in Acts, and that actually it's the story of the church, the, the, the first 28. Guess what? We're writing chapter, I don't know what it is, 310, 4032. I don't know what chapter it is, but we're continuing that story. And so we're going to grab things from Acts that tell us, hey, this is what God does in his people. This is how he moves and works. And this is what we can lean into, we can be a part of, we can be excited about as, as his church. And so last week I tried to, I'm trying to just take three words, three words from Acts and say, this is the why, why it matters, what was going on in, in Acts. And that first word I used last week was inclusion. It's this idea that the church is an organization that has 
an inclusion mindset, that it has a, we are the place that breaks barriers and drops labels. The world all around us is erecting barriers of class, of economic class, of social class, of race, of ethnicity, of all the different things, and they're labeling you. And I remember I said, if you don't believe in labels and they happen, just go to high school. Go to high school tomorrow and you'll find that everybody's being fit into labels. You're a, a jock, you're a nerd, you're a, you know, like we all live through it, right? Amen. Thank the Lord I'm not there. I'm through that. But um, like the church is the place that we don't care. And the book of Acts has, has demonstrated that all through its book. It's like man, woman, that used to be a thing. Not anymore. Equal, equal like the gospels to men and women in equal fashion. Slave, free man. I don't care if you're slave or a free man. The gospels to you. Uh, Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. Uh, this isn't, you know, and uh, on and on and on and on. And in fact, the book is, is honestly a big part of it is missionary journeys where Paul or Peter or other apostles are being moved by God to go into the world and they are saying, listen, world, God wants to include you in his family. And that's, that's not changed. That's the why, that, that why, we should, why we should participate in his kingdom, why we sh should be invested through our time and our resources and our energy. It's because this gospel of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, the kingdom is truly the place where it doesn't matter your label and it doesn't matter where you came from. All are candidates of God's saving power and redeeming grace. This is what Lima needs to know. This is what Lima needs to experience as people are trying to find their identity in so many different areas and peoples and, and all that. Can we be the place that says, listen, no barriers, no labels. Just become a part of the family of God. So I'm preaching last week's sermon and that's not what I'm supposed to do. And actually, I'm just gonna warn you ahead of time. This sermon had like two sections, all right? The second section has eight points. I didn't even get to the second section first service. I'm not going to try to get to it second service. You can just relax. I realized you tried, you put together two sermons, and so I'm feeling good. I don't feel any pressure to get through all my stuff. I'll preach the other eight things later. And some of you are like, well, tell me when that is so I can skip that. That sounds like, that sounds like a lot of points. It's not. But, um, so I want to jump into this, this, this word that seems to, this theme that se seems to run through Acts that has always been the theme of the church. Acts 28 chapters, church history, all throughout the church at its best when it's doing the work of God, when it's being a part of transforming communities, this word has always existed. And it's interesting to me that actually the, kind of the, the statement or the verse that is the foundation for this was a verse Paul shares in Acts chapter 20 when he quotes Jesus himself. The funny thing is, is that this quote of Jesus is not found in the four gospels. It's actually such a cool thing that Paul comes along and gives us a better picture and even greater picture of Jesus' mentality. And this is what Paul said as he's talking about giving his life and service and living to include people into the kingdom. And everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You've heard that before, right? I mean, this, we all probably know this verse. Uh, but if you go home and do a Google search and you put in, do it this afternoon, don't do it right now, hashtag blessed, just see what comes up. I did it this week. And you know what? More times than not, and maybe your search will be a little different, but I think probably if we did a thousand searches, Google searches, hashtag blessed, most of what people will talk about being blessed with is something they have received. That's what I saw. I'm so blessed to have this. 
I'm so blessed to experience that. I'm so blessed to know this person. I'm so blessed, 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 blessed. And Jesus is saying, whoa, whoa, let me help you understand. The blessed life is actually the life that is flipped upside down, that recognizes that really life's blessing is in giving instead of receiving. And so I want to talk about this one little word today, generosity. If the kingdom is represented by inclusion, go into all the world, preach the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world, that's what we're driven by is everybody matters, everybody counts. But the way that that goes forward is through a people who have been transformed in their heart and their mind to become a people who believe in this blessing is in giving and not in receiving. Let me frame this whole conversation. I guess it's not a conversation, right? Because I'm the only one talking. Some of you are like, that sounds like my marriage. <laughs> you can laugh. It's okay. <laughs> Some of you are scared to laugh because... In me chatting with you this morning, uh, this story from being a parent that I think a lot of you can relate with, and being a parent has opened my eyes to so many things. And I've had this happen with all four of my kids. And by the time it happened with Selah, I remember when it happened, it just hit me in the middle of the McDonald's drive through See, if you've been a parent for any time in this culture, in the rat race, in the pace, you realize that as much as you might not want to and as much as you know that it's not the most healthy thing, there are times when the only option, the best option, the most efficient thing to do is to feed your kids McDonald's for supper. Amen? getting from one thing to another, and, and I know all the things that are in the chicken McNuggets, and I don't care. Like, I just got to get them fed. And so you go through the McDonald's drive through and I've done this with all four of my kids, and it finally hit me the fourth time. And we're running through, and I'm talking, and I'm ordering, and that's, oh, that's so stressful with six people. And then you get up, and I paid, and then I pull up in the second window, and they hand me their Happy Meal. And I did what I have done so often. I grab the Happy Meal, I turn around, and I hand it to the, them sitting in their seat right in the second row. And, and um, they open it up, and, and they pull out their nuggets, and they pull out those French fries. And the smell just starts to waft. <laughs> McDonald's French fries are legit. And inevitably, I am moved to turn and say, hey, can I have one of those? You know what I'm saying, right? Some of you are like, I just take them before I even pass them back. <laughs> but I went to go get them. All four kids, without fail, such a study of human nature. You know what they've done? No. <laughs> These are my fries. You know what I'm talking about, right? Come on. It hit me sitting in that drive through the fourth time. I thought, oh man, this must be how the Lord looks at us sometimes. Because I wanted to go, whoa, hold on a second. Your fries. I drove you here. I earned the money so that you can have the fries. Are you following me? The minute I give them to you, you possess them in a way that Regardless of my benevolence to you, you, and I know they're not thinking this, so chill out. I don't lecture my kids about this. But. And furthermore, what you don't understand is 
I could take five of your fries and I could pull back around through the drive-thru and I have the resources to buy you a hundred bags of French fries. It might not be smart, but I could. How limited is your understanding? Amen? And it's just hit me. Chip, that's how you are sometimes. The Lord's given us everything, everything, everything. And furthermore, when he asks of us to partner with him or give to things that matter to him, that are important to him, it's always, we should have the understanding that if he asks us to give, he's the guy that can go back through and buy a hundred more bags for us if he wants. Amen? I want to frame this idea of generosity with us understanding this, maybe from the right perspective as a child of God. And so often he's like, I was, I didn't turn around and berate my kid and tell him what a loser they were and how selfish. I just let it go. Inevitably, they would feel bad. Okay, dad, here's, you know, because we have that relationship. And the Lord often, I, I just think he's like, well, I wish you would live into this principle that I give to you, you give to me, I give you more. It's, anyway, it's a whole thing. It was the TV show ER. How many of you watched that show? It ended like in 09. It's like a 15-year run. I was not one that watched it. I don't watch medical shows. I have a weak stomach, and that's not entertainment. But knowing enough about this show, there was a big deal in our culture. There was this character, Mark Green, a doctor who you got to know through the, through the show, and the drama was woven into the point where he is going to die. And they had crafted this scene that was kind of a climactic scene in that, in that TV show, in that drama, that it comes to this point where he's in a room, he's about to die of a brain tumor, and he's looking at his daughter, and he's just sharing things that he wants to say before he goes. And there's these lines that he shares when he says, be generous. This is his final prescription, so to speak. Be generous with your time. Be generous with your love. Be generous with your life. Be generous. And even on a TV show that wasn't interested in the kingdom of God, those words ring true. They resonate. Can I tell you today that based on the authority of Scripture, the living, breathing words of God himself, lived out through the life of Jesus, giving us the understanding of how to relate with God and then live in relationship with God and then understand the purposes of God, that through this book there's this thing that the blessing of God on your life, the power of God in your life, the anointing of God through your life is in direct correlation to the generosity of your life. There are more promises in Scripture dealing with generosity than any other topic. Not prayer, not believing, not love. I think it makes sense, does it not? You know, because the Lord understands us. He remembers our frame. He knows that we're dust. Like, there's a reason why the thing that he commands the most of us is to fear not. Why? Because we fear. Very easy. And so he has to tell us more times than not, not to fear. And I think there's more promises about generosity because you and I are so much like the kid in the second seat with the french fries. It's so... <laughs> 
It's so human nature to possess, to hold on, to have a scarcity mentality, to think about what could run out or do I have enough? And the Lord has to repeatedly and more often than not promise us and remind us, if you'll trust me, if you open your hands and your life like I opened myself to you, you will be blessed. I will provide. There will be more than enough. And you will actually begin to live at a, li- a level of relationship with me that once you taste it and you see it, you just don't care to ever go back to anything else. I think that's why he promises this or has to promise this so much. I would characterize it this way. Generosity, if I can find it in my notes and all these eight points that I'm not going to talk about, is love in action. Jesus, the epitome of generosity, calls us to follow him, to be like him. To be a Jesus follower is to live generously. The life of a Jesus follower is the life of the open hand. I mean, just right now, do this. Close your hand. Make a fist. Now open it. And this feels so much better. Ah. This is tense, man. This is anxiety ridden. This is like preserving. This is like combative. This is like, I'm going to, this is like, Lord, I'm yours. I need to receive, right? And a hallmark of the first century church was generosity. It makes sense, right? To understand the people of God, first of all, in the Old Testament, um, this was written into the very law of God to be generous. You can't read through the Pentateuch and not catch or not miss the fact that God cares about us looking out for one another, being generous with one another, helping each other out, being like, right? Like it's in the law. In fact, in the minor prophets, that back part of the Old Testament, when the people of God have strayed from God so badly and he's, he's using his prophets to call him back so often, the place in which they have strayed so much is they have lost sight of God's purpose for us to be people who look out for one another, who care about one another, who don't step on each other, who don't live in a dog-eat-dog, climb the ladder, you know, run over your grandma kind of mentality to get ahead. He said, you have strayed from my ways. And in in large part, it's amazing how often he talks about this in the Minor Prophets. He comes back to it. In in one of the ways you've done that is you are not a generous people. You're looking out for yourself over and over and over. And as my people, that's not how we're wired. And so it makes sense that when the church of Jesus springs up, born out of Uh, born out of being the people of God in the Old Testament into this new covenant that at the heart of what's going on continually with God's people is generosity. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, as well as the gospel, was adept at following the money. His account of the life of Jesus has more financial stories and details than any of the other gospels. And so in the book of Acts, Luke is clued into this, these precious glimpses of the financial aspect of the early church. And he seems to suggest that the spiritual world and the financial world are more intertwined than we might think. And so let's jump in and, and look at why would Chip think that generosity is a repeated theme? I'm just going to grab three things. There's more in here. But look at this early on in Acts 4. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. But they shared everything they had. I know it's going to get super quiet, all right? 
Is anybody going to drop the pen right now? With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. Key phrases coming up. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. <laughs> so this next section I'm going to read in my notes because I want to say this very carefully because I don't want you to say something I did not say. Okay? So we're going to walk through this because I think it's a big part of us understanding the why of generosity, how it looks like, how it lives. It's really important. In the earliest church, people of means and power liquidated their goods for the sake of the less powerful. But here's the idea. From time to time, and as there was need. This describes a kind of radical availability as the, status, as the normal status of a person's possessions. That is, the resources, material, political, social, practical, of, of any member of the community, were put at the disposal of the community, even while individual members continued to oversee their particular resources. Key. Rather than systematically prescribing a distribution of wealth in such a way as to ensure flat equality, the earliest church accepted the reality of economic inequality, but practiced a radical generosity whereby goods properly existed for the benefit of the whole and not the individual. This kind of approach is actually challenging because it calls for us to be sensitive uh, to on, uh, having an ongoing responsiveness, a mutual involvement in each other's lives and a continual willingness to hold possessions loosely. Did you catch what I'm saying? I am not saying, as is so often parroted out there because of the... the uh, agendas of so many other things that will look at the early church, they were socialist in nature. That's why we should be socialist as a society. Socialism says what is yours is everybody's. Socialism is requiring you to give your possessions. Huh. Somebody drop the pen? Quiet, right? The church says this. What's mine, mine, can be yours. It is voluntary and life-giving. But see, what happens is, is the Spirit of God begins to transform people into this bent of being generous. When they saw a need, they willingly meant it, met it, even if it meant giving, or definitely it was a giving of their own resources. Ooh, eight minutes. Are you tracking with me today? Listen, there's all sorts of competing messages in our culture. And what has happened is we have allowed those messages to become a part of our identity. And we've tried to find identity in so many things. And so in a culture where these things are batted around, and I would say that they've always been in other cultures batted around. 
we have gotten caught up in taking an antagonistic view at one perspective or another, and we've lost sight of who we have always been called to be. Amen? The church, when it's at its best, when it's being used by the Lord, is bent, is inclined, is willingly generous. The sensitivity of our heart as we walk with Jesus hates to see need, hates to see suffering, hates to see inequity, hates to see injustice, and recognizes that we are called at times as the Spirit moves in our lives to as we have resource to do something about it. I'm kind of, I kind of like dancing in this. I really, I do want you to think today. I mean, we got like these whole things. Can I jump there? Like, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't jump there. This is what Acts reveals to us. This is what the church looks like. Radically Generous. Go to Acts chapter 6. Look at what's being said. In those days, the number of disciples was increasing. The Hellenistic Jews, these, uh, these Jews that um, were not Hebraic in nature as far as their ethnicity, among them complained against the Hebraic Jews, the pure people, because their widows were being overlooked. So there was some prejudice going on in the daily distribution of food. What was going on there was a daily distribution of food. The church is practicing looking out for each other's needs, Right? And so they fix it. It's a beautiful thing. In fact, not only do they fix it, they make the Hellenistic Jews the leaders of it. What, just what a beautiful picture here. You look at Acts chapter 11. During this time, uh, in this part of the book, the, some of the prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This did happen during the reign of Claudius. Verse 29, the disciples... As each one of them was able, these clarifying statements are so important. It makes a, it makes a, clar, it makes a clarity between some kind of socialism and heart-transformed generosity. As the disciples were able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they, this they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas. And Paul, they gave willingly, they gave proportionally, they gave purposely, they gave wisely. And if you begin to walk out of or understand when this was being written, what was going on in the epistles, you begin to understand that the first century Christians were famous for their hospitality to the poor and suffering. In fact, really, the world wasn't changed through wealth or even, dare I say, theology, but through generosity. They took their cue from Jesus. I mean, I shared the Good Samaritan story a few weeks ago, what it means to be a neighbor, how to treat people, uh, and they just lived that out. I mean, in a culture where it was expected to care for the poor of one's family, Christians had this promiscuous help to, be get, to give to all poor, even of other races and religions. In fact, during that first century, as two or three plagues ripped through those regions, it was Christians who characteristically refused to leave and run for the hills, but stayed and cared for the sick and dying. They nursed families of their own and others back to health. In fact, it's such a stark picture of pagan priests in that culture who because they used religion to enrich themselves and became the wealthiest in their society, the pagan priests, the people that were supposed to help the people, were the first people that ran to the hills to save themselves. And yet this group of band of Christians wouldn't go. Honestly, people turn to Christianity not because of theology or miracles, but because of generosity. 
just reading about one of the saints uh, from that, that time. He was, uh, he was in the Roman army at 20 years old, and he was drafted against his will. And he watched as these Christians would bring food to starving prisoners, because in prison, it was just a, a tough thing. And he was so impacted that, by that that he became converted and became one of the early saints of the church. In fact, it's Julian the emperor who tried to return the empire back to paganism, and he failed miserably. And he wrote a letter that survived this, and in that letter, he complains about Christians. And he says this, I couldn't get this off the ground or turn them back to paganism because these people, they're just the kind of people that they support not only their own poor, but they support ours as well. No one's interested in leaving what they're doing or who they are. It's Jesus' words, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? See, that was the culture. If I do be generous, it's going to be so that I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. I'm going to buy your favor. It was, there was no true, pure generosity for the sake of help. It was, I'm going to get something out of this. And in the middle of that culture, here comes Christians who are like, there's need. I want to show love. Because I understand that as a child of the Father, Actually, what I possess is not mine. And actually, the best thing I can do with what I have is to help the gospel. That's, that was their framework. And through the book of Acts, you see Paul, he's raising money from churches to help other churches, to help the needy. It's so everywhere. Out of that first century church, there's hospitals. It's a Christian kind of idea. There's soup kitchens, homeless shelters, orphanages. I mean, the, the adopting of kids from that culture. There's widows. There's widow ministry. Uh, there's addiction, grieving, undereducated. Our history is full. The history of the world is full of the church being generous and looking out for the poor and suffering. And we are the church when we have a robust generosity. One of my heroes, John... Wesley, the thing that so impacts my understanding of who he is, is, is if you look at his life, I mean, the, the guy, he couldn't help but be moved to need where he was at. He started hospitals. He started labor unions because workers were treated unfairly. He started orphanages. He started everything because he was moved and his legacy lives through those things. And so this morning, I know this is like, is anybody else challenged by this? Come on. I don't want to be boring, but this is at least challenging. Come on. Like I sit there my whole, my whole week is like, oh Lord, I can't talk about this because you keep talking to me. And then I realize that in my own life, I've tapped into this. I begin to experience this. There's nothing better than having a generous heart. There's, just, there's no replacement for it. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And my prayer is through talking about this is, I guess the 21st century America and the first century early church, there's a lot of differences. And so, like, we're going to build some big com commune back there and I'll jump in. That's not what I'm calling us to. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. I don't know what this looks like in your life. I, I, I'm not telling you to go sell your home. Do I have to say it? But I am saying as we read the book of Acts, it's pretty clear that the church at its best, when it's changing its Communities And what we need to do going forward is be a people that see what we have in time, money, resources, energy. We see them for a greater purpose. We see that our resources are not an end, but a tool. You see, that's what Jesus and 
Luke chapter 16 said this. He said in this parable of us understanding what we've been giving and how to use it, he says this, if I can find it. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. Uh, That's not saying, hey, go buy beers for the whole bar, right? He's trying to make a point so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. What he's saying is, listen, your wealth, your resources give you the opportunity to do something way more meaningful. It's your resources can become a tool used to see eternal work done. I love what Jim Elliott says, the great missionary martyr to Ecuador. He says this, he is no fool who gives away what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. (laughs) That's the mindset I'm talking about. That's it. And I can't uh, express it enough deep within me But I believe we have an opportunity. This chapter is rich with potential. Our world and our community and our culture is so broken and lost. So many competing messages. So much dysfunction on so many levels. That right now the harvest is, it's it's out there in Lima. And one of the ways that we're going to live into seeing people come to the Lord and broken lives restored and broken homes renewed and kids having a mom and dad that are functional again and people, all these things, addictions, breaking, all those things that we can be a part of is if we see what we have as, okay, Lord, if you want me to, if you want to use it, I'm fine with that. I'm not holding on. I'm open to you. He's not going to sell you to tell your home. You got to live somewhere, okay? So don't stress out on me. But he's probably prompting all of us to live into being generous. Because when that happens, the fire, and he uses us and what we have to do what's always happened. (laughs) So I'm gonna invite you to stand this morning. And I just want you to sing this little chorus we sang earlier, I asked him to sing today. I just want you to think about what you're investing in, what you're giving to, what you're partnering with is the thing that can make a difference, a lasting difference. It's the grace of Jesus Christ that actually has. It's not the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. Amen? That rat race is still going to go on. What can change hearts and lives is the kingdom of God. And would you think about what he does as we sing this chorus a few times before you go? Jonathan, would you? You reveal, you restore all that's broken from the ruins. You redeem, you return all that's stolen from your children. That's what you do. Can we just sing that chorus again? You, re- you rebuild, you restore all that's broken from the ruins. You redeem, you return all that's stolen from. what you do Father this is this is what you call us to to be a part of redeeming, restoring 
And you do that through prompting us to be generous. It's back to the French fry illustration, really. If we could see it from that perspective, when you ask of us, it's it, we're not losing something because you've always you promise us over and over you're gonna take care of us, you're gonna bless us. <laughs> we're fine, we're secure in you. But you ask us to partner with you and Lord, help us to see that what we can be a part of has eternal significance. Continue to speak to us in this way and help us to live in to your plan for us as a people in Jesus, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Have a great, great week.